I am personally interested to know if any of you are or know somebody who thinks they might like to try out to meet the criteria of that therapist that Dr. Gardner mentioned. Somebody who has a good note, there's one hand, anybody else? If you can leave your cards or your words me, I think this work for you. And uh, you have a knowledge of PAS, you're gutsy, no nonsense, no coddling, get on with it, and we'll be prepared to have some kind of a delegated power to do that from a judge. And if, if you aren't that person, but you know somebody who might be, uh, leave that with me. Now, other than that, uh, just, uh, he's going to be a witness of mine in the trial. I hope some of you will go after him. I want to see how good he is under strict cross-examination. Question. Okay. Go ahead. Cross examine. <laughs> Go ahead. By the way, I welcome this in terms of these are some of these are very controversial issues and this is a good opportunity to you know to deal with these. Yes. When you have a child Well questions very loud so all can hear, including me. When you have a child that is the victim of the severe end of parental alienation, what is the recommended treatment and how do you accomplish it? Okay. The treatment, number one, has to be to take the child, remove the child from the indoctrinator. You can see the child seven days a week. I don't care how skillful you are as a therapist. If the child is turned back to the home of the indoctrinator, your therapy is a waste of time. Therapy is not the panacea for all the ills that plague the humanity. Step number one is to take the child away and protect the child from the indoctrinations. And then to, it requires a transitional site, and then slowly bring the child, uh, the, the uh, victimized parent visits the child, expand the, the uh, time with the child. The child has a living experience that the uh, victim is not the the, the ogre, the, the, the maniac, the, the, the whatever, he, the child has been indoctrinated. So I believe it's a debriefing process, it's a, a, a living experiences, joint interviews. This is theoretical. I have, have zero success, zero success in convincing courts to do this. I've, been, I've had transfer of custody, but in terms of, that was in the moderate. I've yet to have a case, in, in all the severes I've had, the court lets the kids stay uh, with the indoctrinator. So it's all theoretical. Um, th I've, uh, there are a couple of colleagues in California who have had limited success uh, with uh, the program. So it's, it, it's hypothetical, but that's how I would approach it. My hope is we're on the brink of, uh, of a change and that courts are going to start to to do this more frequently and uh, face, uh, since it is more likely that the indoctrinator will be a woman, then the risk is that you, you, you're viewed as a sexist, you know, if it's a male judge, uh, a woman judge, then she's a betrayer of, of, of her sex. You have all these political issues which compound this, uh, and I'd address myself to them in the, um, in the uh, materials in the handout on the website. By the way, I was, I'll give you the website number the address, because it's, it's updated as, as much as I can do. It's www.rgardner.com uh, forward slash refs, R-E-F-S, like references. And um, anybody who has any legal citations in which the PAS is recognized by the court I'd be most appreciative of your communicating those to me because uh, I would put them on the website. Uh, and uh, you can, uh, m my address is 155 County Road, C O U N T Y, in Creskill. Uh, it's where Creative Therapeutics is. The same address as Creative Therapeutics, C R E S S K I L L, -L New Jersey, 07626. Okay, sir. What effect uh, is those well on the adults when children that undergo the indoctrination? What effects on the children? No, what effect do they exhibit as adults? Um, those who have been indoctrinated in the severe, I, I, there are no formal f 
follow-up studies, but I can tell you informally what I, what I have uh, come across in my own experience, uh, that they become completely alienated from the victimized parent and that there's no relationship in the vast majority of cases. Um, you um, embedded in the brain circuitry is the notion that the victim is indeed loathsome, dangerous, noxious. Uh, it interferes with um, forming relationships with the, that same, let's say it's a father who is the, the victim. So it's a girl. There is, her model has been, you know, if, if one had a choice between having a father die and a father being alienated in the severe PAS, psychologically you're better off having a dead father not from his point of view, but from the point of view of, of the girl, than having a PAS father. At least, if you, okay, you have the privations of, of, of the father dying when you're young, and all the loss and the grief uh, attendant to that, but generally, your mother is speaking about him positively, uh, as loving, and yeah, he had certain defects, but he, as, a, as a human being who loved you, and we all miss him, as opposed to being indoctrinated throughout your life that this is a wretch, a loathsome creep, uh, whatever word you want to use, and that so when she goes into the dating period in the teens, uh, her model man is, is, is all those terrible things. It, it interferes with relationships, it interferes with working with males as peers, as employers. Uh, this is all, <clears throat> these are projections, I have no studies, this is what seems reasonable to me. This is what I testify in court to. Uh, but it's informal, uh, informal um, experiences over, over the years. Uh, it's a very dangerous situation, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it, uh, I, I have a lot of trouble convincing courts about how terrible a situation it is. Yes? What would happen in a situation where the court awards uh, reversal of custody but the child refuses to go. Well, that's where you have the transition site, where the child must go to the transition site, and there are varying degrees of restriction. Uh, you, sometimes a closed ward in a hospital is the, is the only place. Um, I believe, and it's, it's all in the future, that a, a, one of the problems you have is courts are, in the, in the U.S. at least, uh, giving up on adolescence already. You know, the, the 14, 15, 16, nothing we can do with them anyway. What are we going to do? Put them in jail? Uh, fine them? Well, what do we do? So what's happening is, like, I, I think in the state of Florida, age 14 now, the states are lowering the age to get rid of the cases. 13 in some of the southern states. The kid can make his own decision. Um, and unless there's compelling evidence that it is a uh, poor one, like if the father's taking the 13-year-old kid to bars, and bringing him to brothels, you know, that's enough to, to, to pull him away. But a PAS, PAS is not enough for the court to say, uh, it's not tangible, you can't measure it. So um, an option, and I'm very serious about this, is to take the kid and put him in jail a day or two. Juvenile detention center, I'm not putting hardened criminals. Uh, the kid wants it. He can say, I, this is a very important point, it must have been about 1983, a kid says to me, it was a PAS situation, I just, I don't know, I think I already came up with the label, my first article was in 1985. He says to me, he's about a seven-year-old kid, if I don't go see my daddy, the judge is going to put my mom in jail, isn't he? And he's shaking his head up and down, and every cell in his body is asking me to say yes. And, well, you know, you're supposed to be honest to patients, but sometimes, you know, you, you, uh, you, you say what you know isn't true because the kid's asking you to lie. And I said to him, well, may very well be. He says, okay, then I'll see my father. And then he says to the mother, I'm going to go to see the father, so I don't want you to go to jail. They're begging you for it. They're begging you for it. And the kid says, they want it. They want to have the excuse, I'm protecting my mother from jail by going. I really hate going, say they to her, but I'll go anywhere else, I don't want you to go to jail. But the thing is, the judges ain't sending anybody to jail. If they were to send the people to jail, house arrest will do it, I'm sure, in the vast majority of cases. You leave the house, 
to put you in the clink. And it'll work. I'm positive of it. I'm positive. Uh, the kids need it. Yes? What knowledge do you have of children who have been um, severely alienated, being taken away from that alienating parent and plunked down to the, uh, to the other parent? If in, in the moderate cases you can do it, I've had a few, others have had them, and the, the f feedback has been good. So the, the children, the children that well. I mean, they had a good relationship before. I mean, it, it, it was. Excuse me, wasn't there a boy in Pennsylvania that hung himself after going through this type of therapy? Are you talking about my case? Yes. I can't talk about it publicly. I just say this to you. Do not believe everything you read in the papers, and do not believe everything that the mother of a PAS child says, okay? Uh, I believe it was it made reference to the legal documents in the case. I know the case. I cannot speak of it publicly, okay? And I just say again what I've just said. If you believe that I did what the papers say, then you, you're hearing one side of the story. Okay. I'm not responsible for that child's suicide. Of course you're not. Okay. I want to say something also about this. You have to be very careful uh, when you get involved in, in these cases uh, as, a mental <clears throat> as a mental health professional and you voluntarily involve yourself in custody litigation. You're dealing with warring parties. You, you, you're, in a, you're in a war zone. You're in the middle of a, you're in the no man's land in a tug of, in a, in a, in a, in a war and you may get bullets fired at you. And somebody's good, before you enter the case, you know that one of the parties is going to be very angry at you. And if they're litigious, the law is their track. They have lawyers right there. They think lawsuits. So you, you have a, a high risk of malpractice in such a setting. And uh, if you're in it, you know that. And I say this to you, you have to be very careful. And one of the ways to get sued for malpractice is to publicly s divulge uh, the case so that this is a case in point. My name is listed as somebody involved in that case, and it's true. I can't, I'm not denying it, but that's it, period. The papers call. I say nothing. The answer I give is, if you believe just what this mother said and what the papers say, I can't help that, but you know you're only getting one side of the story. And uh, think about me, what you know of me, and think about if I'm the kind of a person that drives a kid to hang himself. This, if you, from what you know of me, and, and, and make your own judgments. Uh, okay, over, over here, please. Well, I would like to know what happened after the transfer, because I know of two matters in which, you know, the court has in fact transferred a child from <coughs> the, in one case it was the mother's care to the father's care, in the other case it was the father's care to the mother's care. Mm -hmm. And in each case, the child was alienated from the parent, following that, was totally alienated from the parent they were taken from. So you've still got, oh, you wait know, a minute. From the alienation. Wait a minute. They, they became alienated, that they switched? Yes. In the new home, that they became indoctrinated into? Absolutely. Uh, anything, I mean, it, it, it sounds, I, I don't deny that that happens and that, the, that now the new party then worked the kid over. I would assume that the, the younger the child, the, more, the easier it is to do that. Children being more suggest, the younger the more suggestible. Then that part, m it may be a situation where neither should be the parent. You know, a curse on both of their houses. Uh, because if the recipient is now going to start that kind of stuff and is equally un receptive to what can be salvaged, then that parent is deficient. You don't have all these other homes and foster homes uh, so available. That child is cursed to, because then each parent is going to erode the bonding with the other. The, the program I describe is that the victimized parent has the child and then the, the contact with the programmer is monitored depending upon the programmer's ability to pull back and reduce the indoctrinations. Oh, you still want me? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, question here. Yeah, assuming for the moment that the... Uh, I'm going to go forward and hear you better, and then I'll come back. That PAS becomes a recognized uh, diagnostic category under the DSM. So then, uh, so then you have a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And I mean, 
I guess one question is, who has the diagnosis? Secondly is, given that there is a diagnosis of someone, what, what then, uh, how does that then empower the, uh, could that empower the courts more? And thirdly, could that then become an issue for, say, Child Protection Services uh, in severe, moderate or severe cases? Okay. Uh, you know, with, Okay, we, we have to take each question one at a time. The first question was, um, yeah. Oh, who's who's the diagnosis? The child. The diagno a PES is the child's diagnosis. The child has a parental alienation syndrome. Now, a consideration, and, and I'm oversimplifying what's what's in the new book. In the six years between the '92 and the '98 book, I've learned an enormous amount. And have modified a lot, not modified so much, but have elaborated and increased my understanding. Sometimes the indoctrinator is very successful, and uh, because the um, the victimized parent uh, has a fairly weak bond with the. Child, let's say the mother is in the primary custodial parent. Uh, the, the mother was the primary caretaker. The father was working. He wasn't that involved. He was off on business trips, weekends. He was working. So the children want that bondage. She has an easy job. But let's take the other extreme, where the victim was really a, a top-notch father. He was in there. He was into sports. He was a coach. He was in scouts. He this, that, the other thing. He. He was at every play and he was giving talks at the school, the whole package. She's going to have a harder time because the bonding with him is so much stronger. So that in one case, her indoctrinations failed and the other they succeeded. Now, when you are making recommendations to a court, courts are always trying to predict the future, what will be the best. They just can't have a, a short view of it and see where we are now. They have to project somewhat. If you have a very compulsive programmer who's still in the, and the kid's still in the moderate category, and you know that the, she ain't gonna let up once the decision is made, now it's become a, 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 um, a cause that has a, in its own right that it's been in the brain circuitry so long, but it was originally designed just to prevail in the custody dispute, it now has a life of its own, the kids have a life of their own, and they've lost sight of the original reason for the war. Then you may have to make the recommendation of transfer because of the non-curability of the programmer. Things are not as easy as they seem. Uh, so you, as far as the diagnostic label, She's an inducer. Uh, let me say something more about DSM-4 and, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and the diagnosis and the problem. The, the one diagnosis, when you reach the severe, you can use shared psychotic disorder. Um, there is, um, I, I, should, I don't know if you use it here in Canada, the CPT codes. Do you use those? The, uh, I don't know what term these. You, you, you write a you have to use a code for the diagnosis from DSM-4. Then there's another code for the treatment program, uh, whether it's individual therapy, group therapy, and the insurance companies. You don't have, okay. No. Okay, so all this is irrelevant to you because you, you have a national program. Okay, it's, in the United States it's very important because your patient can't get payment unless you put down both code numbers, the treatment code as well as the diagnosis. Now, there is a new book coming out early in January called TSM-1, Therapeutic Statistical Manual 1, a companion volume to DSM-4. And it will have more specific codes for treatment uh, so that you don't just have individual psychotherapy, you can have lots of psychotherapy for separation anxiety disorder, and that has its own code different treatment programs, and the patient can't get insurance reimbursement unless the, the provider puts down that specific code. I have been invited, there's about 300 professionals that have been working about five years on this, 
the, our Medicare, our managed care programs have been requesting it because it will give a more specific uh, information about the nature of the treatment being provided. Now, I have been invited to submit treatment programs, protocols, in four categories. One is on the PAS, the treatment of the PAS. One is on the treatment of children who have been falsely accusing sexual abuse. One is on a game of mine, the talking, feeling, doing game, which will now be recognized as a therapy per se. How many are familiar with that game? No, one. It's, it's used throughout the, the world, really, by therapists, child therapists. And one on the mutual storytelling technique, which is another therapeutic technique I've introduced. Once, and that's coming out now, presumably, hopefully, in January or February. To argue there's no such thing as, D as PAS when people are going to be using it, the, using TSM-1 in order to get insurance reimbursement uh, is, is much harder. So uh, there will be a change then uh, very soon on that. Now, your, um, what other questions did you have there, sir? Well, one was, one other one was that if there's going to be actual diagnoses that are, like on kids, that there suffers from this <coughs> disorder, right? Yeah. Which is, has part of the, I guess, diagnosis includes the, all the knowledge about the symptoms, uh, or the syndrome, which means that it could have very serious repercussions for the children. Do you foresee that the, that the child protection services could be? Uh, <clears throat> it, it, it's very difficult. I believe it's a form of abuse. It's emotional abuse, and the the, the general problem prior to the appearance of uh, PAS on the scene, the the child protection people generally can't do very much with emotional abuse. Uh, it's too subtle, and. Uh, uh, they neglect, you know, the gross neglect is, easy, is easier for them. The mother is psychotic and the, the, the infant is lying in its diapers for three days without being changed and starving and crying. That is, is easy for them. This is more subtle and um, I, I think at this point um, it, it's not a, a child protection um, it's not the kind of a thing that can reasonably refer to the child protection people. I, uh, I, you asked, let me get that yeah, question I, from her. I want to make it. Quick. No, um, I, I'm pointing to her now. Oh, <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, and then we'll get back. I want to get other people a chance. Yeah. When you um, prepare your expert reports, um, you interview these children, and do you interview both the parents, mom and dad? <clears throat> A proper evaluation in any custody case involves the, the evaluator seeing the mother, the father, and the children, both individually and in varying combinations. Any evaluation that doesn't include all of those parties is compromised, and you do everything possible to achieve that goal, in some cases even going to court to testify as to the value of it. The joint interview is the central part of my evaluation. It's the best way of finding out what really went on. Now, so far, it seems that you know you've talked about you know the instigator of all this, which is usually mom. If the majority of cases she has custody of the children, and then there's the victim, and there's sort of like the victim hasn't done anything wrong. I do family mediation, so I you know hear from both people, and she has her complaints about he's late picking the kids up, he's late mm -hmm. dropping them off, mm -hmm. he's late with the checks, he's sloppy about this, they're dirty, they have six tubs, and then he has all the problems, well, you know, I phoned up, I didn't get access because somebody had a cold or was starting all right. to get a cold, and, and you can see kind of the soft signs of this alienation it's starting, right, mm -hmm. that they're, they're starting to be at war with each other. And my question is that, is um, if parents, I, I one thing I think parents have in common is they, they want the best for their kids. Th that they all want? They want the best for their children. Every, every parent says that, and most parents do. They actually do want that, I think. Most, yeah. But aren't these things, <coughs> are, aren't they treatable in that if it's pointed out to them in the early stages about what they're mm. doing, that they're going to raise some little misfit? No. Is no. that what 
you can see heads going this way. What you're describing the, in the first part of your question is, is the normal stuff. Each parent, that's one of the reasons they got divorced. They, they, they have a collection of complaints about each other. We're not talking about that. We're talking about something that goes way beyond it, a campaign of denigration. The brain is, is filled with hatred and that uh, simple confrontation with, look what you're doing to the children, you're corrupting them, you're blinding yourself to the value of grandma and grandpa and your cousins. It doesn't, of, most often, it does not respond to a simple confrontation with reality and trying to get the person to see how misguided is this campaign. It's like the hell hath no fury, like the woman scorned. The rage is so great. Uh, there are many elements that are involved with the economic disparity after divorce. The woman is generally in a far <coughs> inferior position to the man. Uh, her future, her, she has a few kids. The chances of remarriage are less than the man. Um, she can't afford to get as, as effective a lawyer, uh, as committed a lawyer. So this all engenders more rage, which then the best weapon for wrecking vengeance is to rob him of his children, the most powerful weapon. And uh, so that simple logic is not going to override the, the rage that's fueled by these factors. So you think that it truly is a, a dedicated task that these women take, that, that they are perfectly aware of what they're doing? No, no, I'm, I'm, it's not so simple. I think some of, it's, it's a slow, insidious process, and it may, th with a combination of conscious and unconscious and subconscious factors, with things starting off as a conscious lie becomes a delusion. As it goes on, it becomes more concretized in the brain, and it becomes more of a, uh, has a life of its own. Um, the, when you do have some justifiable complaints, Fine, there's always justifiable complaints, as you describe. This goes way above and beyond it. The PAS, there's no abuse. There's nothing to warrant this degree of rejection. It goes way beyond. Yes, you seem to be. I, I'd just like to say, as a psychologist who does assessments for the court, I, I do regularly screen for alienation. Um, I do think it's a, it's a very important and valuable concept. I do take exception with many of the ways that you present, uh, with many of the concepts involved in this the black-white nature that you use. but And I do believe that informed viewers are the best viewers, and so I'd like to just point the audience to this journal, which recently had some critiques on your work, and just to allow diversity okay. in um, people's ability to make their own decisions. Okay. Are you talking about the Fowler article? That's right. That's, okay. one, of, that's one of many. OK, the, the, excuse the, me. The critiques that I've read on your work mostly seminate from individuals who work primarily and exclusively in the fields of abuse. Okay, hold on. Um, I, I, you're like saying a lot of things. I'll address myself to each point. You say block life. I don't know that it's addressable. I just feel that an informed audience well, is the best okay, audience. Uh, and that's all I wanted to say. Okay, please let me respond. Of course. I said at the outset, I'm giving the classical cases. Yes. I said things, the real world is never as, as um, black pure. Black if you, in all fairness to me, if you're going to publicly uh, advise people to read the Fowler article. I'm not advising, just saying there are data on both sides. Please let me finish. Yes. The next time you do it, I invite you to take the next issue, which is in press, in which is my response to oh, the Fowler. That's, that is this journal. The response. Yes, yes I just got it yesterday. Okay, it has my response. That's correct. Okay, fine. And that's, her response to you. Oh, I didn't, I've never seen her response to me. Yes. And they never sent that to me. But it, I don't know what her response is, but, um, <coughs> it, all right, so that you've given them both sides, that's fine. I have no problem with that. Yes. Um, yeah. I want to look at, um, for a minute, I want you to talk about the mild form, because from what you've said, the severe form is somewhere in the future where that's going to be addressed maybe by the courts or by some mandate that nobody seems to have just yet. So in the mild form of parental alienation, what can the alienated parent do to respond to the child that he still has, or she still has access to, to not counteract what the mother is doing or the alienator is doing, but to respond to the child's needs? 
So you have a child in your care on an access basis, you know that they are being programmed. How do you deprogram them or what advice can you give to that parent to respond to what they know is happening? Because if you know well, everything um, they do is gonna be wrong, okay. everything they do is gonna be misinterpreted. Okay. The thing is you have a custody dispute so that the victimized parent is involved in a custody dispute, has decided to uh, fight for primary custody. And I would ask that person, why are you doing this? Do you really think that uh, you are, these children will be better off uh, than they are now with you? And uh, See, the mild case generally evaporates once the court decision is made. The child, the, neither the mother or the programmer or the child has uh, the need for the, for, for the campaign anymore. And, uh, if it's so ingrained, how does it disappear so easily? Why doesn't it sustain itself oh, because, well, by the pure nature of the fact it, it that will, it has it, been programmed? It may then develop into the moderate, and then you have a things escalate over time. Uh, and can you just tell me three things that a parent would do to respond? Three things that what? Yeah, what would the parent do to respond if the child Oh, in the moderate you know, case? It, well, the, the mild to the moderate. Uh, oh, well, one thing to do, workable. see, when you, I think you said something about not criticizing the other parent. Did you say something along those lines? Well, that everything is going, like, no matter what they do, it's going to be seen that way, and the child can't necessarily deal no matter what age it is. It can't deal with the rational explanation mm -hmm. that this information is false or hang on I'll okay. take you over to this person and they'll explain to you that didn't happen. Okay. You may not be able to do anything because the primary problem is not the child but the indoctrinating parent and to there may be very little you can do with the child do you because have no hope for the alienated parent to be able to respond very to little because he's working against formidable adversary. The, the, prime, the alienator has the children 80-90% of the time. The alienator has a stronger bond with the children. And, I mean, things like, listen, you're nine years old. You're old enough to come to some decisions yourself as to what is true and false, what your own eyes see. You don't have to believe everything you hear. To, your mother tells you that I am this. Have you ever seen me do this? Uh, is there any reason for you to believe? You can try to counteract it some way with confrontations with reality. More importantly, to be, let's say, a good, committed, sacrificing parent who provides healthy parenting, serves as an antidote. And so that the child, without any conscious awareness, is still having the living experience that this is a good parent. And that's the best antidote. And along with what I said earlier, that the, um, that the, um, uh, the programmer has a harder time if the child have a stronger bond with the victim, and an easier time if the bonding with the victim is weaker, but not in any way neglectful or uh, uh, abusive. But, you know, we don't have cures for all the diseases, okay? And this is a disease, and th you have to know what you can help and what you can't. Um, physicians are more comfortable with accepting that reality than people who are in other disciplines. We deal with terminal cancer, and we know there are certain people that you can't cure, and you just try to make them comfortable, know your limits. and. The problem is the parent, the indoctrinating parent. If you have no access to her, whether it be the victimized parent or the therapist, the disease is going to be continued to, to be generated. And, and that's the reality of the world. Yeah. Do you have um, any kind of statistics on how many children commit suicide from being cut off from a parent by an alienator? No. But are you going back to that other case? No, I'm not. Okay. Um, I, I'm I, I, with my own experiences. I, uh, I cannot, it may very well be that there have been uh, a suicide, uh, but you have to appreciate this very important point. 
that I believe that the suicidal risk would be very small from everything I know of suicide in children and everything I know about PAS for this reason. Very ancient wisdom. The opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. Very ancient wisdom, a great truth of this world. So that the PAS child doesn't hate the victim as so repeatedly professed. And that the years of, I'll get to you in a minute, next, will be my next. The years of parenting have been embedded in the brain circuitry and that that's why in many cases when you do the transfer, you can get back to where you were, uh, even in the moderate cases. Um, and that therefore, this is, in many cases, it's a relief to be in the home of the victimized parent because uh, the courts order it. You can say to the indoctrinator, the stupid judge made me go there. Um, and that that parent has a long history up to the custody dispute of parenting, of good parenting. And so the likelihood of committing suicide when you're in that kind of a situation is, is I see it very small. I have never personally had that experience. And if the child did commit suicide or, or tried seriously, the more likely thing is that it was related to many other factors, one of which was embroiled in a child custody dispute for X number of years, <coughs> being a rope, a tug of war, subjected to all the horrors and grief of that situation separate from the PAS, and possibly all the other uh, psychopathologically inducing experiences that the child had in, in life prior to this to divorce. All that's in there. Um, sir. Uh, yeah, a couple things. Um, first of all, welcome to BC. Thank you. Um, we have a massive uh, divorce industry here, which also encompasses common law. Uh, encompasses, uh, encompasses? Common law relationships. This is distinct in Canada. There's only one other problem. Can you say that word again? Common law relationships. Oh, common law relationships. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. I wanted to say, first of all, to yourself that I don't think that putting children in jail uh, is, is a viable solution. It's, it's the first time I've heard it. Mm -hmm. However, I have selected a few other things that I, I very much admire you for. In regard to psychologists' reports... Oh, can I interrupt you? I, I do better with one issue at a time. Okay, let, let me stop with the jail thing, and then I'll, I'll hear you out for the others. Because I can't remember three answers for three questions. Sir? Um, what I said was there was a judge, I think, in Colorado who put a, about a seven or eight-year-old kid in jail for a very short period of time, and the kid went to visit. And I also said I'm not recommending you put kids in with hardened criminals, and I also said juvenile detention centers. What I'm saying is that the child is begging for an excuse, and that disposition can provide the child with the excuse. It, it's a very circumscribed, and it's worthy of consideration, like it's worthy of consideration to put, and I'm thinking more in terms of teenagers, not seven-year-olds. I, I wouldn't recommend it uh, for a seven-year-old. A 13 or 14-year-old, overnight in jail, I would have no problem with. Overnight in a juvenile detention center, which, which it look, it's a jail, it looks like a jail, but it's, you know, it, 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 it's worth a try, worth a consideration, that's what I'm saying. Go ahead. Second question. I, I would agree with it's worth a consideration. There are a multitude of other 14 and 13 year olds in juvenile detention centers as well. Um, in regard to the lady that spoke here, and I see that she's got up and left. Yes. Um, Section 15 psychologist reports here in BC are done, not as you suggested, but they are done on people that are not even in attendance. They're not questioned. They're done in absence. It, it, well, it, Section 15 is, is the custody evaluations? No, it, it is a psychologist report done on the parent. Okay. The parent is not there to have the report done on them. How, how do they do an evaluation of someone you don't see? I don't understand. That's a good point, sir. But what we have here is we have a profit-making <coughs> venture. We have a divorce industry, and the children have become chattels. It, it's a little bit, it's, it's really severe here in BC. The lady who made her point, I see, has got up and left. Yeah, she's she, she, she very quickly, has, yeah. She has not stuck around to be accountable. 
I would suggest that she might be one of those psychologists that makes reports and is not accountable for her report. Neither does she do the investigation, nor is she accountable, because there's only a, a uh, profession of, of, of psychologist to be accountable to. She's not accountable to the judge. She's not accountable for a decision to the individual. So I don't give too much credence in her. I would uh, perhaps... Well, you don't know who she is. I don't, I don't know. No, I don't. You don't know if she's in that category at all. I don't. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but if you're speaking, I, see, I what you're saying, I can't relate to. I'm not familiar with, with people who are writing psychological reports on individuals they haven't evaluated. I, I, they I haven't find met that. Them. What? They haven't met them. Is that true? Yes. No, it's not. That's not the question. Can you stand up? Yeah. yeah. They, they took my child away from me. He made a report of my daughter and me. I didn't, I didn't even talk to him. They, they made a report on you and, and you right. weren't seen. I, I, I don't even know the psychologist. Okay. If, he was, if you didn't remember, he was sitting right here. He also Now, there are people, and it's unconscionable, there are people, psychologists and psychiatrists and social workers in the U.S. who do, who feel no, uh, nothing's uh, improper with, let's say, seeing the mother and then uh, making recommendations about the father without just purely on what the mother has said, and will make very specific recommendations about custody and even uh, incarceration for sex abuse. Uh, that's unconscionable, uh, but it's not sanctioned by the profession as a formal uh, uh, approved method of, it's discouraged, it's not uh, approved, but it's, it's a common practice. Judges will take it and make orders on the basis of it. and effect. And the cause of parental alienation, I, I won't mention gender, but lies with the custodial parent. It's very rare that the custodial parent here in the province of BC is ever held accountable for this because there's a profit to be made from this. You need a lawyer. If you can't afford a lawyer, if you're too poor, one will be provided for you. But if you're in the middle, you're classified as a poor person. If you can afford a lawyer, and you look at basically spending $130,000 for what's already registered in your consent order, what's already registered in the charter for you to have access to your own child, then the lawyers can make a profit. The judges can ensure that they have a job to do. And all of the court reporters in the whole system here in the province of BC is it's run amok. Okay. Unfortunately, there's not a balance as of yet. What you're describing is no different from uh, all the other states that I've been involved in. So that the, um, I, I've said this, and I'll say it again, that if people who were disputing over the custody of their children could not go into a courtroom with that problem, that overall humanity would be better off. There would be certain families who would be worse off, but the vast majority would be better off. They'd somehow resolve the problem in some way, and uh, most of them would not farm the children out to third parties or abandon them in the streets, and that uh, they would all save themselves the grief and the psychological trauma of being involved in a custody dispute, and uh, that say there should be a law against it, or that the courts would not consider it within their province to uh, attend to such cases, the world in general would be better off. On, 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 to, uh, other people have questions. Yes, ma'am. Well, I, just to reply to that very briefly, my understanding um, in working with the courts is actually the scheme is not in fact the norm is not that case. The norm is actually described in the proper custody evaluation. Where both parties are seen. Yeah, and that's yeah. more of the norm, and that's what most judges would accept. Anyway, I don't want to dwell on that. Um, and I'm sure, you know, I know there are cases that have happened, but the norm, I think, mean, is a great extension. Mm -hmm. um, and then, in your experience, what is the role of the
the method of dispute resolution that the parents choose to resolve parenting. So whether the method, say, alternate dispute, meaning mediation, connection between that and development of PAS? Um, people who uh, are involved, a, a PAS inducer is generally not a candidate for mediation. I'll go even further and say, one of the things they welcome is the court-ordered mediation because time is on the side of the PAS inducer and the court doesn't take action so it puts them back into therapy, mediation, arbitration, what happens, what have you. There's more obstructionism, lack of cooperation, there's more time. By the time you get back to court a year or two later, by which time the thing is ever more deeply entrenched and to stretch it out five years doesn't take much effort at all. Um, and so uh, the mediation is not for PAS inducers. And uh, uh, what else can I say? Well, that sort of goes back it, to Lily's comment that mm -hmm. they really, the PAS inducer really has a plan for the ratchet. It, it feeds right into this, what they want, yeah. But you see, that's where you get, and it's, a, in a, it's an endless, very costly, tens of thousands of dollars process for a I mean, I'm not going to talk about my own case, but a couple of years ago, you did a report for me, which was PAS, right on the, on the head. But of course, you go to court, three court appearances later, a punitive court order cutting off all access, and then mediation, and now it's in mediation. What I want to ask you is that if, when one is ready to give up, on the courts and on therapies and on mediation and on psychologists and all the, 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 the costly process. Is there anything you can recommend by way of some sort of uh, guerrilla warfare that a father can sort of embark on by himself or with the help of his own extended family that can gradually undercut the PAS that is, uh, the PAS to me. Undercut the, uh, and, and the part of the, of the children? Under, that, that can sort of, yes, that can sort of undermine the influence. Uh, it seems to me that, that uh, the PAS, uh, an image for that is sort of the, the implacable alienated, alienating mother. It's sort of, it's like, it's like trying to sue El Nino for causing a hurricane. I mean, there's just not, that you just can't, there's no way. No, because even after the litigation is over, um, there is, let's say the child is eight years old, the litigation is over, um, the, the indoctrinating parent has been successful, uh, the brain circuitry is still spinning around with memories of the hated parent, and then as the years go by, it just continues to sit there, and um, there's no correction of the distortions, and uh, there is no contact that enables correction of the distortions through experience. And the, the notion uh, being embedded in, in a young, suggestible mind uh, then uh, becomes kind of concretized. It's a very pessimistic prognosis, but that's the reality of the world. And um, I, I wish I were able to say I have, uh, I've seen 10 years later rapprochement. I haven't seen it. Just one follow-up question. What if the kids are already teenagers when that uh, alienation takes place? Say that again? What if the kids are already in their early teens when the alienation happens? When it starts? Well, I think when there's a better starts, prognosis yeah. because then they've gotten 13, 14 years of, of uh, foundational healthy experiences and there's a better chance that when they're 17 or 18 that they may still be approachable. and then less under the influence. They're off work in college, what have you. But uh, you still have that hiatus of three or four years and still embedment in the brain circuitry of the, of the noxious ideas about the, uh, the victimized parent. Yes, sir? I recall the movie Clueless with Alicia Silverstone. There's a very powerful scene that comes about two-thirds way through the movie. Alicia and her friends are at school, and Alicia, playing the heroine, turns on one of her girlfriends and makes a very cutting remark. It suddenly turns the comedy into kind of a tragedy. And what's so powerful, uh, taking right from the original Jane Austen novel that's based on, is that it's so gratuitous. And suddenly we, re we, we realize that teenagers can be mean. And they're not induced enough. That's the beauty of the scene. Alicia Silverstone has not been induced, 
No one has tried to put it into her, into her, but she's just damn mean. And we suddenly realize this in the middle of a comedy. And elementary school teachers often tell me how much meanness they see in little kids. And we know that the elementary school teachers are not trying to induce that in their, in their students. Just the exact opposite. The teachers from the outset are trying to squelch it. Yet the kids, even at that early age, seem to be mean. And I recall as a family law practitioner once saying to a client of mine who thought that his mother, that the children's mother, was trying to induce hatred off him, I recall saying to him once, I think you've got a mean kid. And what's your question to me? Well, leading up to this, is there such a thing as auto-induced alienation? In other words, kids just don't like dad or just don't like mom in the same way that Alicia Silverstone just turned on her girlfriend and something you saw, that evil streak. Okay. Could even be found a little kid beating up each other in grade one. Okay. We are talking about another phenomenon that has nothing to do with PAS. Long before PAS arrived on the scene, there were very angry children who were even murderers and that they had other factors operative. The, the, the human animal is, has within it genetic programming for aggression and fighting and uh, hostility and has uh, this can generate murder and the, the children are the parents of the adults in a way. Uh, at Salem witch trials when they hanged 19 people the accusing girls danced and sang. Uh, and uh, so it, it, it's the, the, the human animal is capable of this. Uh, Conrad Lorenz, the Nobel Prize winner, once said, I have discovered the missing link between the higher apes and civilized man. It is we. And it's a great wisdom in that. So that you do have ang angry children that are, that anger generated from generally privations in their family, uh, dysfunctional families, broken homes, and various other factors that can generate anger that have nothing to do with PAS. PAS can mobilize those forces and then channel them against the victimized parent uh, because the, there was the potential within the human psyche to, to develop anger and uh, it, it's then channeled against the victimized parent. But the, uh, that's basically my answer to your question. Yeah. What about a, a mother, or uh, in this case, um, say a mother that's right out of birth um, doesn't acknowledge the father, even though he su wants to support, he sees they're helpful. She just doesn't want him to be involved, say. And then, um, so of course she moves or whatever. She totally won't uh, share information or be, you know, uh, share anything about the child. And then, so then the court system goes through, but because the, the father or or whatever has hasn't had a chance to bond to this child or, or to spend time proving his parenting capabilities, um, of course the courts give her custody so this situation leads on and as it, as it leads on, by the time the children are three and four now they're talking and they don't even know who their father is and, and the court system doesn't help so is, is this just gonna, should the father just give up because after 10 years the, the child is not going to know his father and, and Okay, you, you, you're saying, uh, uh, you're talking about a situation in which, a, is there a PAS here? Yeah. Then it's, if the father indeed has allowed himself to be pushed out, or was pushed out, then the PAS, um, the foundational elements were operative long before the, 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 the um, onset of the programming. I describe in my book, there are mothers uh, who use... Uh, who view the uh, father as the sperm donor, and that once he has provided that service, his services can be dispensed with. They may grow up in homes in which it's, it's a matriarchal society. The man is like a piece of furniture. He's expected to provide food, clothing, and shelter, and then watch his football game and not bother anybody. And he's not respected, and uh, he served his purpose, uh, donating sperm and then continuing to provide the food, clothing, and shelter. That's the model that the woman has grown up with, and it's likely that she will marry a man who is in accordance with that model. But in, in, in the generation of her youth, divorce was not common. Now it is, and she may, for whatever reason, now dispense with his services 
because she doesn't like this extra piece of furniture around the house, gets under her feet, what have you. Um, and, uh, but that man, if he is indeed from birth so lacking in involvement, then she has a better chance of, uh, of uh, attenuating a weak bond. And uh, so it, even before PAS, that person um, w w was not that involved. But the father does what the court orders and, and pays his support and tries to be there the best he can. And okay, well, to okay, look, I, I have a feeling it's I, I'm discussing an individual case with it, you or someone you know. Uh, I can't go further with it uh, because I don't know the details of that particular case. Um, you know, I, I, you mentioned that about jokes, and I, jokes come to my mind. Uh, Mr. Lindy, I'm reminded of the joke of the man goes to the doctor. The doctor says, what's the problem? He says, doctor, he says, I have a friend who uh, had uh, met a strange woman, had sex with her, and about two weeks later he noticed he had this oozing sore on his penis. What do you think that can be? He says, pull down your pants, let me take a look at your friend, and I'll tell you what I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Next question. <laughs> yes. Just before the just before the end of the break, there you talked about uh, hysteria and paranoia. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's uh, not to use a psychological test. I don't know. MMPI you mentioned. Right. But I said there's a, an, in different contexts, but I mentioned yeah. those three terms. But uh, is PSS or PMS? <coughs> <laughs> PMS? I didn't talk about that. As far as I know. Is PAS? PAS. Yeah, more common. Uh, right after separation. And uh, is it possible? Like, I noticed you're aligning yourself sort of like with your professional colleague's uh, lawyer. Now, I'm aligning myself with. In your book there, uh, Talk a little bit about lawyers on page 211. I talk about lawyers. I'm sure yeah, more uh, than just page 211. Yeah, I don't throw the whole thing there. But uh, is it possible that uh, there's a, another symptom, uh, symptom out there with lawyer inducing parental alienation syndrome, with causing extra paranoia, hysteria? Uh, absolutely. And, Without uh, a question. It's all, it's all matter. Is it possible that it's just whoever pays <coughs> the pockets the most money usually wins the, wins the court cases? Okay, listen, you're asking a lot of questions, please. I, I, can't, I can't deal with all the questions, I, okay. one at a time. You yes, ask about lawyers inducing PASs? Absolutely. Because they, th their mission is to support their client's position in the adversary system. And then, even though you may think your, your client is a nutty person, but she's a rich lady, so you might as well take her box and, and, uh, and foster it and support it, even though you know that this is corrupting the children, may destroy them, you were taught in law school that that's your job, and uh, uh, many of them will not look any further, and, and that's one of the problems. So, what you're just commenting here is like, that's like emotional and uh, financial abuse by lawyers increasing the syndrome further. Lawyer? Uh, um, Voltaire, Voltaire once said, I have been ruined twice in my life. Once when I lost the lawsuit, and once when I won a lawsuit. Okay? No one wins a lawsuit with lawyers. The, the clients both lose because they are destroyed by it generally. I'm not just talking financially, I'm talking emotionally. The psychological drain of years of litigation is, can't be translated into money. It's in your coronary arteries, your cerebral arteries, your, your, your bowels, your gut. Your, it, 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 uh, it's one of the most psychologically traumatic experiences an individual can be subjected to. And, and uh, uh, that's the lawyer's profession. To, uh, and, and we live in a, in a system where the adversary system is used to find out who's a better parent. A system that was designed, presumably, as the best way of finding out where the person committed the crime is now being used to see whether parent A or parent B should spend 60% of the time versus 45% of the time uh, with the children. Uh, it's insane. Good. Let's one more quick with other people. Okay, just one more quick one. Uh, 
Uh, in a case there where there's the obvious P AS, yeah. um, when the look, when custody was given sort of 50 50, and uh, after spending maybe 20, 30,000 dollars in lawyers, uh, lawyers aren't happy, so then they get false restraining orders, they get uh, accused of quote of these falsified reports with encouraging a, a parent, the PS, uh, in the name of parent, to falsify a police statement. And then further, uh, go to children and families and they're saying that this guy's a, a rapist. Like this is all 14 months after the fact. And okay, what's your question to me? Well, with all these things going on, is there any ethics, like, are professionals supposed to have a code of ethics or does anything go into the court? What is there to, what do you feel? Like? Okay, the purpose of the adversary system is to make money for lawyers. All other reasons are rationalizations. Uh, in most cases, there, is, there are alternative methods of dispute resolution that would be far superior and less expensive and less psychologically draining. England and her former colonies are the only places in the world that buy into this, and Canada and the U.S. were former colonies. Uh, in, the, in the continent, uh, in Europe, they don't use the adversary system. Uh, and they use what's called the inquisitorial system. I'm not saying that it's the Spanish Inquisition, but it, it's, it's a panel, and there's more free flow, and it isn't as adversarial. And the idea that the best way to find out the truth is to have two liars argue against one another <laughs> is what basically goes on in the adversary system. And law students are generally not told that the alternative methods that have been used in the world from the history of humanity uh, that also have proven themselves effective, if not far more effective, in finding out the truth. But it's, this, you see, if you want to change the system, you've got to go to the legislators, most of whom are lawyers. So why should they change a system where they're making most of their money from? It is a, uh, it's an abomination. Um, and that's the system that is used, and my feeble attempts to write about mediation and alternative methods of dispute resolution are, are there, but it's, 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 uh, it's the likelihood of my seeing any significant change in my lifetime is very small. Society isn't likely to get, to get wise so quickly because the people that they that scream to change are, are lawyers. They're the ones in the legislators, in the legislatures. Okay, let's move on. Yeah. Are you planning to develop a test or a questionnaire in order to predict uh, a person's potential to induce PAS? No, I would be very do. I have no intention of doing it. It never entered my mind, and uh, I, I would consider it extremely risky, and it would be pseudoscience and. Uh, um, one, uh, the, in my book I do describe uh, the kinds of personality types that are more likely to develop, become PAS inducers, overprotective mothers, um, people who uh, um, are uh, uh, um, uh, very uh, hysterical are more likely to uh, I develop it. Paranoids are more likely to. But I, uh, uh, a woman who's put in a very vulnerable position by the divorce because she has nothing but her children uh, and so that the, all that she has, she doesn't have other things to give her ego enhancement. Uh, the economic disparity increases the likelihood um, of it's happening. Uh, the family model of the man is the sperm donor and on and on. I, I would be very... Um, weary of any kind of a checklist of that kind. Sir. This is probably too simple a question, but I want to put more simple in context. <clears throat> if uh, the alienated parent comes to the lawyer and says, look, you know, I'm, and he gives you the symptoms of the beginnings or early stages of PAS, and he wants to know, what should I do? And basically the two extremes, I guess, would be one would be to go to court and try and get the court to deal with it in a, mm -hmm. in a definitive manner to try and intervene somehow. And 
the other extreme would be, and this actually happened if, if the client or the potential uh, client said, they just sort of sit back and not feed into it. Because if you go to court, it's just going to make it worse because the, the other parent will become more defensive and will become more denying and all these things. Which is the worst thing for the, for the child? I mean, it, which it, is the first, worst decision? You know? It's, it's, um, it's like many situations in which you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Uh, the court presumably would offer you hope to put the lids on the alienator and let her know or him know that if you don't cut this out, you may lose the children and there may be other sanctions. The problem is the court in 1998 cannot be relied upon to do that in my experience and the experience of most others like myself who have been involved in this. The courts are not doing it. I am optimistic, however, that over the next few years that the courts are going to get wise and start using their power. And what's needed is um, some well-publicized cases in which the transfer proved uh, useful and that the people who recommend it are not branded as sexist as, or anything else because you're making a recommendation that is more than not going to be painful to a woman. It's, un it's unpopular in 1998 for even a judge to do that. Can we wrap it up? It's 8.30. Is anybody's got a dying? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, show you what's going on with that.